All right, so this was the last slide that we covered uh, last time. We're going to take it, take it from there. Uh, you might want to keep that. This is a very valuable table that you're going to use. If you get in, uh, into this kind of field, you are going to, um, you're going to find this very useful. All right. Uh, okay. Now, we're going to take a look at the T568 wiring details. We have already done that in the lab, so now we're going to take a closer look at what you have done or what we have done together during the labs. So here is something that's called an RJ45 modular plug or RJ40, uh, RJ, RJ48, uh, <laughs> RJ45 jack or plug. Uh, RJ stands for registered jag, uh, so uh, this is a plug, this is not a jag, however this jag fits the plug, so it's considered as RJ45. Um, now the pin numbers uh, are as such, from, uh, from here there's one, two, three, four, five, we just count it from left to right. Um, when we're holding, if you were facing this jag right here, or this plug, and the latching clip is facing away from you and you see the prongs. So these are the number of the pins. That's how we count. This is not how we count the pairs. This is just the pins. All right. Now, here is the picture of the pins. Remember uh, when we did the RG45 uh, or T568 uh, wiring scheme. Now, with the pots, the first pair was right in the middle. All right, so here is pair one, would be pins five and six. No, six, yes, five and six, all right? One, two, three, four and five, four and five, sorry, all right? Pins four and five, yeah, there we go. Uh, four and five, this will be the two middle, this is pair one, if it's the pots, or the USOC configuration, universal or uh, universal ordering service code. USOC. Let me write it down. Universal service ordering code. Okay, so that's uh, basically what it was. That's the use of configuration. So in use of configuration, it's mostly for the phone and for some control signals. Control signals are the signals that control things. Usually switch them on and off. So uh, here, uh, when we talk about uh, when we talk about pairs in use of configuration, here is pair one right in the middle, and there's pair two just goes outside on both sides. And pair three and pair four, they just, you just count them outwards. All right, so that's the use of configuration. Now, this is T568 standard. Right? Uh, when we talk about the, um, the, 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 the Ethernet type of a configuration, which is T568 standard, here's pair number one, no difference from USOC. Pair number two, also no difference from USOC. But then pair three and four are different. So I do a little dance. Here's a one and two and three and four. All right? Again, one, two, three, and four. All right? So that's the uh, blue, orange, green, and brown for T568A configuration. But T568B configuration, you just switch the oranges and the greens. So blue, green, orange, and brown. But take a reference from the A configuration because that's uh, you know the numbers of pairs. Uh, pair number one, remember the twenty-five pair color code: blue, orange, green, brown slate. But we only have four, so it's blue, orange, green, brown. Blue, orange, green, brown. Okay. Uh, so if you look at this slide here, pins four and five, right in the middle. Blue. Orange, and this is if you're looking at from this side right here, right from this side. So blue, here's orange, here's green, and here is brown. And all the stripes, you see here, all the stripes. 
there's a solid and there's a stripe. So blue pair has a solid and there's a stripe. So stripe is, a, you know, since we have the white group, we're dealing with a white group here. So it will be a white conductor with uh, uh, blue dashes sometimes or a stripe. Okay. So all the, all the stripes, if you're looking from this side, all the stripes are going to be on the left. You see, there's green, solid, and then stripe. Everything is on the left. Orange stripe on the left, and here's the brown stripe on the left, except for the blue pair. It's just reversed. It's just the way it has been decided. Uh, right now, uh, how are we considering those pairs? Well, depending on which side you you're, you're looking from. So you could see tip and ring, tip and ring, tip and ring, tip and ring. Okay, right here. Uh, but also, uh, what do we have here? Um, orange and green. In, when it comes to so here's the thing. When it comes to cat five, cat five e. All right. There's only two pairs are being used. There's orange and green. So when you're installing a surveillance camera, for example. And when you have an existing wire, and when you plug in the tester, just like the tester that we used in the, in the classroom to test that uh, Ethernet cable, and let's say that uh, the, 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 the tester gives you a fail, it fails, the test fails, uh, on maybe because there is some broken conductor somewhere. So you're going to look at which conductors are broken. Okay. And I had situations like that. The client uh, had a longer cable, and it was really difficult to uh, to run a new cable. Yes, it, everything is possible, but for what price? Okay. And the problem was that the, the, you know, when I was checking the existing wiring, I, it was a camera, surveillance camera, security camera. Uh, the cable failed. The test failed. I look. Okay, which pair? Which uh, which conductor is broken? And it was the brown one. I go. Okay. That's fine because the Ethernet cable CAT 5E uses only two pairs, green and orange. One is transmit, one is receive, and which is which depends on which end you're looking for uh, from. So uh, I accepted that cable just for that thing, and I said, okay, it's going to cost so much to run a new wire plus because you know time and materials because it's a, it was a difficult uh, job to do for that one. Uh, but you, you know, even though the cable doesn't pass the test but it's still okay because we're only using green and orange and those two are okay so uh, sometimes you know it's not an ideal situation but in some cases in the reality the reality is that uh, sometimes you're going to have something like that now when it comes to cut six and up then all four pairs are being used right? so now when you do a crossover cable when it cuts cut 5e only when you don't want to cross over either uh, uh, you know the, um, the jacks, but usually when you do the jacks, which would be the, the female uh, end of that, which would be just a computer jack in the wall and maybe computer jack in the patch panel. Right? So usually you would do the straight links. Very, very rarely, almost never, you do the crossover for that one. You just you write, write straight links. And what's a straight link? It's A configuration on one end and A configuration on the other end, or B configuration on one end and B configuration on the other end. Okay? Then you got a straight link. If you want to go one A and one B, on which side you switch them, you got a crossover link. So when you do a crossover link for, usually it would be patch cords, uh, uh, the Ethernet cables. Uh, if you want to do crossover for CAT 5E, you only have to switch orange and the greens, and we'll talk about a little bit more details. Uh, and when we uh, uh, when we do crossover cable for cut six and up, then not only we have to switch green and orange or orange and green, we also have to switch blues and brown. Right? That's how I use the crossover cable. So sometimes when you Google things, and you, if you Google crossover. Uh, Ethernet crossover cable pinout or something like that, uh, then you're going to, you might get confused because you're going to have different images. In some images, you're going to see just the greens and oranges switched and the blues are intact, just a straight through. And sometimes you're going to see all four of them switched. And you're going to go, 
Uh, which is correct. Well, the answer is simple. If it's cat 5e, you only have to switch orange and green. If it's cat 6 and up, then you have to switch orange and green and blue and brown. Okay. Alright, so here is the configuration. All right, so here's a, here's a jack on one side, here's a jack on the other side. All right, so there would be NIC, which would be a network interface card. All right, from that side, the green, uh, the pins one and two, which would be the green, if this is the A configuration, all right, then this would be a transmit side. And on the hub or a, or a switch or the other equipment, of course, these two pins would be received. And if you have a straight link cable, those two are going to talk to each other. The transmit is going to talk to receive, and the receive is going to talk to transmit. You're going to have a nice communication going on. So whatever is being transmitted on one side is going to be received on the other side. And the, the, uh, the MDI uh, stands for medium dependent interface, which would be most of the time would be a switch or a hub. Right? Uh, most of the time right now it's going to be a switch or a modem or something like that. Uh, because hubs are not as widely used uh, uh, anymore. Right? So, uh, so that's how the CAT 5E would behave. Right? When you want to do a crossover cable, then you're going to switch. If you want to connect, connect two switches together, you would have a crossover cable, so the transmit talks to receive, and the transmit talks to receive. However, now these days, uh, most of the equipment that's being newly produced, most of the time it is going to have an automatic sensing circuitry. So even whenever you plug in straight link or cross crossover cable, it's going to go through a little routine to see uh, which configuration, which cable you have plugged in. And it's going to turn on and it's going to adjust itself to it. However, sometimes uh, you're going to still see some of the older equipment that uh, if you want to connect two switches together, you're going to need a crossover cable. If it's a CAT 5E, you just use a CAT 5E crossover patch cord um, and, uh, and, and you're good, right? So, uh, uh, NIC and NIC, network interface card, network interface card. In this case, uh, if you want to connect, for example, two PCs together, two computers together, for whatever reason, if you just want to connect them with a cable, then you would uh, we would just uh, use the crossover cable so those two computers can talk to each other. So the transmit talks to receive from one end and so on. Because if you use the straight link on two interface cards that are the same, you would have no communication because the transmit is going to try to talk to transmit and the receive is going to try to talk to receive and there will be no communication. So this is CAT 5E, right? Now, this is comparing that. Remember those uh, when we, we, produced, we produced crossover cables? Oh, my computer wants to update. Let's just postpone that, right? So <clears throat> uh, remember those, those test screens, those test shots that we did? This is basically how we are comparing that to the crossover cable. You see, there's a wire map going on, and you might want to compare that to your, to your test results to this uh, picture right here. And you're going to see that, yes, uh, when we test it, when we press the test button on the tester, it failed because it was looking for a straight link. So it failed the wire map, but it failed in a certain way. Right? So, uh, so that's why uh, we, uh, we're going to have uh, that kind of a wire map going on, right? Now, when it comes to using CAT 6 and up, as I said, we need to not only cross the oranges and greens on both sides, we also have to cross the blues and the browns, right? So that's the uh, end of the... Uh, uh, I just don't want to rush through that because... Uh, uh, MDI uh, is medium dependent interface. Right? So mid, it's a very fancy word uh, or fancy description to a box <laughs> that uh, in order to communicate with another box, it needs some sort of a medium to communicate through. And it could be a 
cable in this case, in our case, right? Some of them uh, communicate through air, which like Bluetooth would be one of them because when you have Bluetooth, you're not connecting any wires and somehow magically there's a communication. So they're using electromagnetic waves, right? Like radio waves to communicate. Um, yeah, and uh, NIC stands for Network Interface Card. So in the, uh, in, uh, in the bigger PCs, uh, it, it, it looks like a Network Interface Card. You don't want to Google that, what it looks like. And uh, now so laptops and tablets and whatnot, you also have Network Interface Cards, but they're built into the motherboard uh, anymore. Okay. And they're smaller, of course. Okay. All right, so let's uh, look at some of the other stuff now this is a network cabling course what i'm trying to give you is as much information and knowledge that you can turn into a knowledge what's the difference between information and knowledge information would be just like having a recipe to bake a loaf of bread you have the information you have the recipe and the directions of how to do it but uh, this is I always say that uh, you use those directions and do everything that it said on the piece of paper and almost guarantee you that what's going to come out of the oven is not going to be a piece of bread it's going to be something that you can't eat and then you're going to perfect those uh, or you're going to improve on your uh, on your motions that you go through and maybe consult with some other people and finally, you're going to bake a loaf of bread. So then you have the knowledge of how to do it. Right? So I'm just trying to get you as much information that you can turn into a knowledge. Um, when it comes to finding a job in this sort of field, it's I, I call it the modern type of telecommunications because the traditional telecommunications would be the radio waves. Right? Uh, connecting radios and using radios and whatnot. So the radios, walkie-talkies and, uh, and radio stations. But this is the, also telecommunications, which is communication over, communicating over a distance, but it's the modern version of that, which would be, you know, um, data infrastructure. But it's not just running cables and connecting them at both ends, because when you are going to find yourself a job in this sort of field, you're going to be required not only connect cables from one to the other and test them or certify them and give it to the client. There you go. Uh, use your IT people that can connect your equipment and make your network work. Network work. All right. So, um, um, Mm, so you can make 50k in your first year as a network cable specialist. Well, that's um, um, well, you probably could, but you would have to go into your own business. So first year, I would suggest that you find yourself a job somewhere, right? If you really want to go into your own business, or just do some simple things. First year, uh, if you're experienced and you open your own business, you're gonna make m way more than 50k. Uh, but it's going to be hard, uh, hard work for you. I, uh, I've done it, and um, it is hard work because you know, running your own business is a hard job. Let me tell you that. But that's a completely different topic. Eh? Um, so um, uh, also, what you're going to be required is to install systems, like for example, a security alarm. Uh, security surveillance, which will be cameras. That's a very popular thing. Uh, there are uh, a lot of companies that are looking for people who can install the you know, cameras and security alarms as well. Uh, beauty of that is that you can actually go into your own on your own uh, when you get enough experience uh, doing that kind of stuff, right? But there's also other things like um, uh, sound systems. So be pro audio, and it will be permanent installations uh, depending on what that PA system lab that we did uh, is part of it, right? Uh, there are school PA systems, there are no school systems. No school systems are the systems that uh, when a patient is in in hospital bed there's a little button that they press uh, and uh, that lets the nurses station know that somebody needs help or assistance all right so um, uh, so that uh, it's just uh, not just a bunch of wires connected to a bunch of light bulbs and somewhere to the power supply there are whole computerized systems that work a certain way so that uh, there's a whole bunch of a bunch of systems depending on you know, home theaters 
the thing never ends. When we're talking uh, with Mr. Cunningham, so he's got about 30 years experience uh, in this field. I also have about 30 years of experience in this field. And we both, independently of each other, we did different things for different companies. And we're just uh, saying it with a smile to each other. So, you know, so you are almost as good as I am. And I'm almost as good as you are because this field is so vast that in 30 years, there are things that he has done that I haven't touched yet. And there are things that I have done and he hasn't done yet. So it's, it's, there's a lot of systems. Usually you specialize in very few things uh, if, you wanna, if you just don't want to go crazy. You know? <laughs> All right. So let's just look at this thing here. First thing will be security. I'm just going to give you um, a little bit of um, synopsis on, on how those things work. By no means, after this class, you're going to be able to install security systems or fire alarms and whatnot, but at least you're going to know the idea of how the system works. Right? And then, uh, uh, of course, when it comes to security alarms, for example, uh, just because you know how to install one and program it and configure it and the whole thing, and, uh, and then there's going to be a different brand, you're going to almost have to relearn how to do that, except for some of the basics, basics are remaining the basics, right? It's like you still have to run a wire from one place to another. You still have to connect those sensors in certain ways. And most of the stuff is the differences would be the um, um, configuration of the head end, all right? So there, there are the one, two, three um, uh, YouTube links that uh, I would encourage you to watch. It's going to give you a little bit more idea of what those things are. One of them is water detectors keypads and uh, and there's some of the uh, paradox um, um, security systems right so uh, just watch them and, uh, and and see what you can make out with it I'm not gonna test you on that but uh, but uh, it's it would be very good if you did, if you did watch those now here is the main board example for a security alarm let's quickly analyze what uh, what those connections are All right I'm going to just zoom in a little bit. I'm zooming on the Zoom session, so it's like a Zoom squared. <laughs> nah. uh, okay, so right from the left, those screw terminals. Yeah. Um, here's the AC. Okay, that board needs to be powered. So over here, you plug in. Uh, usually, it's like the uh, doorbell transformer, which is like 18 volts AC. Okay? just to power this whole thing up. And you just connect those things. Polarity makes no difference because it's AC in this here, in this case. All right, next thing we have, the something that's called a bell. All right, that's nothing to do with Bell Canada. It's a bell, they call it as a uh, noise-making device. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have a positive and negative side. If the security alarm trips when it's armed and it goes into alarm state, then you're going to see 12 volts DC on the uh, on the on the terminals here, and you can just connect that to something that's called a siren. All right, and uh, the siren is looks like a horn type of a speaker, and it just makes a very annoying and loud loud noise. There are different uh, powers. You know, some we got 30 watt siren. That's annoying and loud. Some of them was like 15 watt sirens. It's also annoying and it's also loud, but not as loud as the 30 watt siren. Right? So uh, when the alarm trips, you're going to see 12 volts on that. And I, when you apply 12 volts to a siren, it is going to make noise. Right? Now over here you have program, um, uh, you have program uh, terminals, and those can be configured to. Um, to perform different actions. Like for example, you can, perf uh, you can configure one, two, or three, or four program terminal to have usually 12 volts based on something happening, okay? So you can have different zones, uh, zones, um, different areas, because I, I don't want to call them zones, different areas, because uh, the alarm system the security alarm system can be configured into areas. Like, for example, this would be uh, um, offices, right? And the offices for the weekend, they will be armed. 
but there would be maybe some sort of a production area that uh, is busy during the weekend that people work there and they have to get in there so the security has to be disarmed for that portion of the building right so uh, so the program button can the program button the program terminal can be programmed to act a certain way uh, if uh, if something happens if something trips then you might want to trigger some other device uh, it could be uh, sending a signal to a relay that is going to close another contact that is going to trigger something else uh, like for example a recording device or something like that right or or yeah so that would be the program and different companies different brands they have different uh, way of configuring them right and here is a common there's also a relay on here no, there's a common of the relay here is normally up normally closed and normally open um, terminal and the relay is basically a dry contact you also have a relay on this particular board that can be programmed in the programming section of this whole security system that the relay can be triggered if something happens it could be triggered if the system goes in a state of alarm or it could be triggered if um, somebody arms it could be triggering or uh, closing the contact or it could be changing the state when somebody disarms or it could be connect or it could be configured to work together with uh, uh, let's say a sump pump um, uh, sensor if the sump pump doesn't work the water goes certain level there is a sump pump sensor connected to the security alarm and that could trigger some other things like an alarm or something like that it could be triggered configured to different zones so here's a relay right now the next thing here we have something that's called auxiliary this is a constant 12 volts providing power to devices such as motion sensors such as uh, glass break detectors such as expansion boards anything that needs power right and you need to look at the specifications of how much current it can is, is it, this thing is able to provide and it might vary from one system to another so uh, you could have smart devices connected or sorry smart devices active devices or passive devices active device would be something like a motion sensor or a glass break detector or, um, or, or a keypad be an active device an active device is a device that needs power to work a passive device would be a door contact which would be just a, something that's called a reed switch you know anybody plays anybody play saxophone uh, the the mouthpiece is connected to a reed that makes it vibrate so it looks like a reed all right so you, you bring a magnet close to that reed and that thing closes on it, right so um, this would be a passive device which means it doesn't require power to operate it's just a magnet so you mount the sensor on the door frame and you mount the magnet on the door when you when the door comes to close in, in close proximity to the sensor or the switch it makes the switch close when you are away the switch opens on you and you know things can trigger right? and here we have the zones this board is capable of one two three four five six seven eight zones all right what is a zone? A zone is a circuit uh, that is going to work in a certain way. Uh, usually in the alarm systems, you're going to have a closed zone. That means it's a closed circuit. That means this thing is not being triggered, right? And here's the common terminal. So if there's a door contact, which only has, you're going to use two wires two wires two conductors one pair right? because opens and closes it goes to the door sensor you would connect one side of the connect conduct uh, the switch to a common terminal and the other one will be to zone one and you're going to have a nice closed circuit if the door is closed which means the magnet is in the close proximity uh, with the uh, with the switch right? and zone two could be uh, contacts from a motion sensor zone three could be some other dark contacts that are installed on the windows 
Right? So you can configure those zones. Like in the zone one, you can have just a main door, for example. Right? Zone two, there could be contacts on all the windows in the living room or some sort of room. Right? Zone three could be motion sensors in this same, in the same room. Zone four could be a glass break detector in the same room or in a different room. And then zone five, uh, so uh, and so on. You can you can just so we can distinguish different um, different areas or different zones. Um, that's why we have the zones in the print on the printed circuit board of the um, of the security alarm. And the commons are just they're connected to each other. The common is a common, right? Um, so you can only fit so many wires here and now then but it's the same thing you can choose this one or that one to connect like for example zone 4 to this or you can connect zone four, 5 to that if you connect zone 5 to common this one here is the same thing because this is, this is very exactly the same point and here is so these are the zones and here is the communication um, um, communication terminal communications terminal because uh, some of the security arms are still using or are, are capable of using the uh, POTS line, regular telephone system, right? or right now the telephone system, the POTS, uh, POTS lines, right? telephone line, single line. So you have tip and ring, and you have tip one and ring one. What does that mean? Right? The way the security alarm is connected is that if there is a household that has a single line uh, telephone line connected to it. It's just one line. You connect that line first before it goes anywhere else. You connect it to the tip and ring of the security alarm. Okay? And then you grab that from tip one and ring one and continue that to the rest of the house. So if there is an alarm and let's say somebody didn't hang up the phone properly or maybe somebody is talking on the phone or maybe somebody took the phone off the hook, doesn't matter that security alarm is going to steal that line if there's a conversation going on it's going to cut you off it's going to hang up that line get a dial tone call the monitoring station communicate with that send the information and it's going to release the phone line that's how that works um, there are different ways of communications uh, some of it are going through the through the ethernet um, and there are different uh, different ways of connecting that like for example here's a memory key you can plug in or uh, that's for storing the programming or you can have a um, what is that serial communication uh, uh, terminal here uh, you can connect something that's called a serial interface and that serial interface can, can you can connect your laptop to it or you can connect uh, something that's called the Ethernet inter, uh, network interface Right? And from there, you have a RG45 jack on that, and you can connect that to a network, and you can also configure the alarm to communicate through a computer network. Or you can connect a wireless uh, device as well. So you never know what is being triggered uh, uh, when, uh, when the alarm is being tripped. Okay, so that's the security alarm main board example. We just analyzed that. Um, oh, this is just a zoom, zoomed in. Uh, slides that we uh that we went through also there's another terminal here yeah and this is a backup battery terminal all the security alarms are backed up with the power from a battery so if the power goes down you're going to have a backup battery so it falls the power falls back onto a battery and it has a constant charger it's like a like a tender it maintains the battery charged and you might have to replace the battery every five, six years when it goes bad, you know, but the system is going to let you know. Um, and uh, and so you, you connect the battery in order to still maintain some sort of power for a certain length of time. And when the client is going to ask you, all right, so we get the battery. So when the power goes down, how long do we have? Well, there's not exactly, there's not exact way to tell how long it's going to have. It depends on how many security uh, motion sensors you have, how many keypads you have, and how often they're going to be triggered. Um, so usually you would have about a couple hours. Uh, whoops, what did they do? Uh, yeah, uh, that, uh, that, uh, 
usually have about a couple hours before the system drains the battery all right and sometimes what happens is that uh, when the power goes down the system is going to use whatever the communications it has uh, it can be programmed to let the monitoring station know um, that, uh, that the power went down and the system is basically operating from a battery power and when the monitoring station receives that signal um, it could have, there could be a set of instructions based on your alarm system um, that if that thing happens, they might, the client might request that the monitoring station calls them and informs them about that, right? So smart devices, uh, how many smart devices? You see that, uh, where is it? Uh, right here, the auxiliary here. Where is that? Auxiliary here. Uh, the auxiliary uh, provides the power to something like motion sensors and so on and so on. So the devices, passive devices such as door contacts usually would be, they only use two conductors or one pair of the cable. Uh, the smart devices on the smart device, I keep using saying smart devices, the active devices such as motion sensors and whatnot, they need power so they would use two pairs. One pair you're going to use for providing the power to the device and the other pair you're going to uh, have um, for the signal. Yeah. And we'll analyze a little bit how the signal works. There's one more terminal here that says bus. All right. So bus, it's a data bus. It goes to all the active smart, smart devices. Right. So smart devices would be uh, keypads, there would be expansion boards and anything that requires data communications. Usually will be keypads or expansion boards. Or sometimes uh, some of the systems can be interfaced to something like, like access control. Would be a, uh, you know, swipe the car to enter the door, uh, to enter the, uh, the building. Um, so um, it's just two uh, conductors, one pair that provides a communication with all the devices in a bus sort of configuration. What's a bus? It's two wires and everything is tapped in in parallel and there is some magic happening that they are able to communicate with everything is able to talk to everything else through those two wires. Uh, all right, how, uh, okay, we're doing okay. Uh, so how are the, um, how are the door contacts being um, <clears throat> being connected. So here's an example of a dark contact. Uh, common zone, blah, blah, blah. normally closed, normally open. Single normally closed sensor with uh, end of line resistor. Okay, there you go. So here is just a normally closed system. So if this is a zone, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or whatnot, there's one. Uh, so you connect that to one side of this, of this uh, dark contact or a switch. And then the other side connects to the common. So when the, when the magnet is in close proximity with the switch, the switch closes and provides a closed loop that uh, the zone is considered at rest. Right? Now, if you remove the magnet away from that, then the switch opens and you're going to have an open zone. That means uh, you know, you, if the system is not armed, you're going to have an indication that such and such door is open. And nothing's going to happen, but if the system is armed, then um, you know, alarm can trigger. So there's one way of doing that. The other way of connecting door contacts would be something like with the end of line resistor. The resistor's values change, might change, might vary depending on the companies and brands. So whatever you're installing, and if you want to use end of line resistor, and you have to program that zone to be as end of line, right? So extra security measure. For example, um, when um, uh, when the system is at rest, you're going that zone is going to see a certain resistance, certain value, and it's going to consider it as um, the zone closed or a door closed or loop complete. Right? Um, if somebody for some reason connect uh, joins those wires together. It is going to not sense that resistance is going to sense a dead short and that's going to be no good. It's going to consider that as no good. Also, some, some companies, what they will have is they will, they will have a way of doubling zones. So let's say there's a board that is capable of connecting eight zones. 
all right? It can be configured into 16 zone board if there's a possibility like that, all right? So uh, when, uh, when that happens, you connect two circuits to that. One is going to be the short loop, I mean, the um, in this way here, okay, without any sort of closed loop, with pretty much something close to zero resistance. You're always going to have some resistance on the wires, uh, depending on how long, so there's a tolerance. And to the same zone, you can connect another device with the end of line resistors, and the circuitry inside that board is going to sense that uh, it has, is going to treat it as two zones. So it could be zone one and zone nine on the same two terminals. All right, here's where we connect motion sensors. Here is an example of a motion sensor. And when you take the cover off, you're going to see the main board of that uh, motion sensor. Oh, what's going on here? It's not reacting, not reacting. Not reacting to my mouse. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Here's a motion sensor. Typical motion sensor. If you uh, if you look closely at those terminals right here, you're going to see something like this. Now, I'm showing you one, two, three, four terminals, and this one has six. We'll talk about the other two. So, usually it would be a power that is supplied, and usually you would use red and black for the power. As opposed to if it was a telephone uh, connection, it would have uh, uh, red and green. But this is not a telephone system. We're still using the same colors for the, something that's called a Z wire, which would be a straight untwisted wire, untwisted pair, non-twisted pair. And red and black goes to the 12 volt DC, and the other side of that goes to the auxiliary plus and minus, just to get the power, right? because a motion sensor has electronic circuitry that needs to be powered. And the other one here will be common and normally closed. So if the system, if this motion sensor is at rest, it is going to have closed loop. It's going to provide a closed loop to this to the zone, and the zone is going to think that everything is okay. In some cases, you might want to have normally open, and then when uh, when something happens, it's going to close in order to produce change. But normally, usually, you would use, just use the common and normally closed. This, also, this one here is a temper switch, temper terminal. Uh, the temper switch right here, that's a temper switch. When you put the cover on, that switch is being pressed and it's operating. Okay, So you, usually you would uh, run um, Instead of okay, one, of those, one of the wires is going to go to common, then the other one is going to go to one of the one of the terminals to the temper switch, and from there you're going to go back to the normally closed. So you have the closed loop, loop the loop closed when the cover is on. If somebody wants to tamper with that device, trying to take the cover off then the temper switch is going to release and it's just like triggering you know, the, 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 um, the whole system. So sometimes those temper switched are connect switches are connected and sometimes they're not connected depending on the um, uh, uh, level of security you want to get uh, in this. Uh, that's here. Oh, this thing is not cooperating with me today. So this is how we connect the motion sensors. Now, when it comes to uh, connecting uh, zones, you can put more than one sensor in the zone. So for example, if there are three windows that open and they're side by side, you don't need to put those three windows contacts on different zones. You're going to run out of zones pretty quickly when you do that. So let's say this is a window number one, this is window number two, this is window number three, and you can just s connect them in series. So basically all the windows are closed, then the whole thing has a closed loop, normally closed, 
and the whole system is um, is at rest. As soon as somebody opens one of the windows, then well, the whole system, the whole line is getting getting broken, um, and you're gonna open loop, and the system is going to react. Right? Now, uh, security alarm sensors. What do we have? We have motion sensors, door contacts, glass break sensors, smoke sensors, heat sensors, water level sensors, seismic, panic and wired, some of them could be wired, hardwired, and some of them could be wireless. What would be a seismic uh, contact? A seismic, seismic sensor is basically sensing vibrations, and they are very sensitive things. Seismic, seismic uh, sensors quite often are being put on safes in the banks. So if somebody is trying to drill a hole in the safe, it's going to cause vibrations or something like that, and that thing is going to sense it and trigger, right? So that would be seismic. Water level sensors, usually used in the sump pumps, and that zone that we would be connected to the sump pump would be something like a 24-hour 24, 24 zone, which means you don't need to arm the system for that, for that zone to be active. So uh, whether the system is armed or disarmed, that zone can be configured to trigger the alarm uh, when, let's say, the zone opens. And it kind of make it actually makes sense because if it's going, if it is connected to a, um, if it's uh, monitoring the sump pump uh, condition, if the sump pump is low, this the 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 this, the, um, the the float is low then the sump pump is not going to trigger the relay. Right? But if it go, the water level goes high, you want, this, you want to be notified whether your alarm system is armed or not. So that's, uh, that's the like, water level. Heat sensors and smoke sensors. Uh, you can have fire alarm characteristics in certain security alarms. And the zone can be programmed as a fire zone which also would be, uh, that zone would be active 24 seven, right? So you don't need to arm the system for the fire, alarm, for the fire zone to trigger if something happens. Uh, so in the residential areas, you can connect those fire, you can program those, you can program any zone to be a fire zone. It's all in a matter of programming. And uh, um, um, those will be connected uh, to heat detectors and smoke detectors. Smoke detectors, you connect them according to whatever the code is in your area. And it would be, uh, right now, I think it's pretty much any closed area if you want to have, uh, but you've got to verify that. Right? And here's the phone. Um, so um, uh, heat detectors um, uh, would be mostly um kind of installed somewhere in the furnace room close to the furnace so if there's a fire in the furnace room the heat is going to uh cause the uh the the, the sensor to to trip right uh sometimes you want a smoke detector and sometimes you want a heat detector depending on uh on the on the functionality of the system panic button Panic sensor. Panic buttons usually are the buttons that are at the countertops or underneath the countertops or around there, uh, you know, variety stores or stores or some sensitive areas, uh, offices, uh, when people have difficult conversations with some other people, uh, then those panic buttons would be hidden somewhere. And if there's a trouble, that person can hit that uh, uh, panic button. And that is also going to uh, trigger the security alarm. Annunciators that are that are con um, consistent with the security alarms, right? Bell, which is the siren. Strobe, you can have strobe light connected to the siren. You can have a device that produces uh, that that produces strobe light and the siren at the same time, or sometimes you might want to have an alarm system that is silent. You don't want to, if somebody breaks into certain offices or certain areas. You don't want them to know that the security alarm has triggered and sent the signal to the um, uh, to the monitoring station. So they might be in there thinking that everything is okay and the police could be on the way. Right? Uh, control will be keypads to control to arm and disarm the system, and sometimes quite often they're going to be used to, uh, to program the system. Laptops. Um, 
usually will be connected to uh, to either monitor the state of the system or usually to be programming because the you know the alarm systems used to be much simpler years ago that you could program this thing from the keypad but now it's so much easier to program program things with with laptop and sometimes sometimes it's the only way to use the laptop to program the whole system ip ip interface um, this would be an interface that is connected to the main board that you can connect that uh, you can plug in ethernet core uh, cable in and um, um, that can that can communicate with the whole network right remote access uh, remote access um, uh, some of the systems uh, or most of them right now you have remote controls just like for your tv just like a remote phobe a few buttons there and uh, for example you can program the system that if you arm it from a remote control the whole outside parameter arms but whatever is inside the motion sensors they don't arm so you can go to sleep right and uh, if anybody breaks in from the outside uh, then the alarm is going to trigger but if you uh, if you're just going to wake up in the middle and go to the fridge to have a glass of milk then uh, then the system is not going to trigger because those uh, those um, zones that are that are connected uh, to the to the alarm they will be considered as inside so that's the the um, uh, the type of arming is called stay arm right so there will be regular arm which everything is armed and you leave the house no matter what happens something triggers then the alarm triggers or you can have something that's called a stay arm and usually that is when you go to sleep so you can just use your remote control flip the alarm on and uh, and just go to sleep so that's called stay arm uh, and uh, while okay so that was the wireless remote control and the remote access uh, control you can you can because a lot of those systems right now can be plugged on pretty much most of them can be interfaced with your home network or the lan system local area network then uh, you could have remote access to your alarm system from a cell phone from another laptop and so on so that's it interfacing what could be interfaced with the security alarm access control can be interfaced okay? so what's access control access control is well, access control would be electric strikes door strikes uh, that could be released so um, uh, the electric door strike can be released from a main reception somewhere and or quite often you see the access control in the apartment buildings that's access control so uh, you dial somebody's uh, number there and they communicate and they press whatever number on their phone or whatever the station and you can hear that kind of a buzzing thing so that's access control uh, access control also it's a very popular feature for um, real estate agencies right because real estate agencies would have office that um, would have um, cubicles uh, workstations uh, on so the agents can come over the sales agents can come uh, and work uh, in there uh, and the agency could be hiring maybe 120 80 agents and they give them the phobes so they can use the phobe or a card access card to swipe it about the door sensor uh, proximity sensor and that uh, that can disarm the building and release the door strike so you can access the building right? uh, why is it so popular because um, with the sales agencies like uh, real estate agencies uh, some people join the, then some people leave the company and so on so in that uh, if there was no access control everybody would have to have a key cut so you can they can ent enter the, the door so you would have to cut maybe 120 keys but if somebody leaves and you don't want them to have access to that then you have to change the locks and cut another 120 keys for everybody so that would be a pain in the neck right so uh usually when when this is very popular thing access control for for, for those type of agencies is that if somebody leaves you just deactivate their uh, key fob and that's it you have no access to it all right um, so access control is a system on its own that controls all the doors and based on whatever happens you know so so sometimes those 
access control systems can be interfaced with the security alarm. Right? So it not only opens the door for you, but it also disarms the system. And when you leave, you close the door and you swipe the card twice, uh, and, um, and the system is armed without even you having to put any kind of a uh, code. Right? Uh, monitoring, uh, the alarm systems are not connected straight to police. Okay? The alarm systems are connected to something that's called monitoring stations. Police does not have uh, the monitoring facilities. Police will respond to a call, but they, the, the alarm system is not connected to police. Alarm system is usually connected to something that's called a monitoring stations. And there are different companies that do just that. They monitor alarms. You can buy a um, um, membership there if you have a business. Uh, and they say, look, I'm installing uh, alarm systems. Can you do the monitoring for them? And they will love you because uh, you're going to get more clients, more clients. And the more clients they have, the more clients you have, they take monitoring, the more clients they have. And every client means money. It's a monthly residue income. Uh, you know, you get 200 clients uh, and you have a pretty good salary just for having monitoring uh, done. All right. Plus, if you get 200 clients, there's always some service calls, there's somebody moving, somebody wants to do some addition. So uh, it takes a little bit long time to establish 200 clients. Uh, it could be a couple of years, three, sometimes four years, but uh, it is possible, right? And others, others are others. Cable, cable involved, Z type of a cable, no twist. And I'm just going to tell you why there is no twist in this type of security cable. Uh, when you have a twist, um it's good for eliminating the crosstalk and interference but when you have a twisted pair and it's connected to a dark contact then it works against you because a twist acts as an inductor it has inductors properties and what do we know about inductors inductors do not like change the more sudden the change is applied to an inductor, the more opposition you're going to get from the inductor in order for things to stay the same. So what happens is that when you open it and close the door very fast, if it's a twisted pair with inductive properties, it's going to oppose that change. So that open and close fast is not going to get to the zone. So the zone might never see it that something happened. So that's why untwisted pair should be used for security contacts. Uh, and the type of a cable is Z type of cable. This is Z4 because it has one, two, three, four conductors. It's a straight cable. Sometimes it's called security cable or security alarm cable, but it's Z4. Uh, you can get Z8 or Z16 and the number indicates the number of conductors. Right? Also, uh, you can get them in something that's called, you might want to check your code, electrical code, something that's called FT4 and FT6, FT4 or FT6. Right? FT4 and FT6, the difference between those two type of cables is the jacketing. Right? And it has to do with the fire uh, regulations. If the system is in the cold air return plenum, find out what the cold air return plenum is. Uh, sometimes you're going to have to install FT6 cables because FT6 cables are fire retardant. They do not burn as fast as the FT4 and they do, because they don't burn as fast as that, they release less toxic films and you have to have more fire to do for that thing to start burning and start releasing toxic films. FT4, uh, they, they will burn quickly and they will release toxic films. So sometimes you need to have that, sometimes you need to have that, but it depends on the on the fire code, uh, local electrical code, when you need to, uh, to have FT4 or FT6. FT6 is about three times more expensive than FT4, but if you need FT6, uh, that goes also with the data cables, right? telephone cables, is the jacketing. It has nothing to do with the specifications of the cable, it's the jacketing. So uh, if you install, if you need to have FT6 cabling, which is three times as, more, as much expensive, 
and you install FT4, you can bet on it when the when you're going to have an inspection of the building before it's released as a commercial building or a residential or whatever it is. They will know. They are trained. They have a trained eye to see where they, you know, whether you put. So uh, yeah. Okay. Um, this is as far as we went. We just covered the uh, the uh, the uh, security alarm, and we're going to continue next time we see each other. Uh, when it comes to uh, to that, because we have to, uh, we have some other systems, fire alarm systems, and there's some other systems that we have uh, I haven't talked to you about. Okay, so I'm going to explain to you uh, the other systems, um, just so you know the idea of how they work. If you get yourself a job installing that any particular systems, you're going to get additional training on the job on how to install a specific particular system but I'm just giving you the idea of how they work. Okay, so it's one minute till the end, and I think we're going to stop right here, and I will see you when I see you, all right? Uh, the labs are doing pretty good, going pretty good. I'm happy to see, I'm proud of you. I have to say that, all right? Um, I read that in the book that I have to say that, no, just now. I'm really, really happy to see that you guys, are the paperwork that you're filling out, is looking more and more professional to the point that is basically what it look it would look like um, on the job site, all right? And uh, you're 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 watching the videos, you're getting prepared, you are getting the habits of a well well groomed um, uh, technician or installer or uh, or an employee, okay? Uh, and that is, trust me, those habits that you're developing right now, that I'm happy to see that you're developing, they're going to help you get a job and they're going to help you keep the job. So I'm really, really happy to see that. There's a huge difference between the first time I saw you in September and now, and that makes me really happy. Okay, cool. So it's, well, we're one minute over time. Do you receive uh, pre-built motherboards and have to hook up the system using a pre-built motherboards? Depends on what... Okay, so uh, I'm going to give you the um, kind of like a more broad answer to that because a lot of the systems that uh, that are, are, are going to be installed, whether, whether it's like a specific uh, retail store or a specific uh, fast food restaurant or maybe another facility, uh, like a, you know... Um, uh, usually it will be a retail and uh, and so on, uh, or even the phone systems, VoIP phone systems. A lot of the equipment is not being sold by you. It's not even being sold by the company who hires you, but is being sold by a huge company that covers, let's say, all the Home Depots in the whole North America, or all the McDonald's in America, right? Uh, then you're going to the equipment that's being sold, shipped to you for you to install. A lot of it is going to be pre-programmed and you're just going to have to install and maybe you're going to have to get in with your laptop and be on the phone with the technical support in order to do some final configuration or something like that. So yes, a lot of the equipment is pre-programmed. Right? Uh, but if you're in a business on its own and you're installing a mediocre size type of a security alarm, then uh, you're going to um, you're going to get some training uh, on how to program this or install this install and program this specific system. And now, how do you get trained if you're on in the business on your own? The systems that you're getting is from distributors. You don't get like let's say if it's a Paradox or DSC system or whatnot. You're not getting it straight from the manufacturer. You're getting it from the distributors. It will be the distributor is uh, sometimes they are small facilities and sometimes they are huge that do not sell to public. You have to have a registered business and you have to have account with them and register with them as a business. And then you have access to the specific type of equipment that you're installing. And those distributors, they, have, they organize periodically, once in a while, uh, common instructive sessions and they will send you invites to them. Once a year they have conventions that they have manufacturers coming there and do presentations on this and that and there's a new system that's coming out 
there's going to be a representative from certain type of manufacturer or, 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 or brand. They're going to come and say, okay, uh, two months from now or a month from now, we're going to have a rep from Paradox or a rep from DSC or something. And they, they're going to introduce the new system that they come out, uh, that, they, that, that just came out from them, right? So uh, that's how you get training on the job site, on the, if you're on the business, in the business on your own. Or if you want for somebody else, your boss might send you to get trained on a specific type of a system. So, so yes, sometimes things are being pre-programmed and sometimes um, a motherboard in every, is there going to be a motherboard in every system? Um, a lot of the devices right now are Ethernet smart. So whether you're going to call it a motherboard, sometimes it's called a main board, or sometimes it's just called a board. Right? So uh, quite often, anything that is a security alarm or access control or, or nurse control, nurse, um, nurse call system, and even the PA systems, like uh, school PA systems, for example, they're all programmable devices. And you just have to learn how to use them and you're getting the training from the distributors. Or sometimes on the job, you're going to get trained. All right, cool. That's pretty much it for today. We went five minutes over time. And it's nice outside, nice and sunny outside. Okay, guys, I'll see you when I see you. And this is it for today. Thank you very much.